Hello everybody, Raspberry Barrel here, and welcome to part three of Queen's Star the Underestimated's biography. We left off and they had just defeated Toffee. And so now it's time for season three, episode five, and beyond. Let's get right into it. Please forgive me if I stutter, hesitate, or mispronounce anything, and if you hear any annoying sounds in the background, sorry. Let's begin. A day or two after the defeat of Toffee, Marco was ready to go back to Earth and get ready for his sophomore year of high school at Echo Creek. Star and Marco were saying goodbye to each other and were having a very hard time. Marco was awarded a cape from King River, and the king told him that if he ever wanted to, he could return and become a knight. Marco asked if Star had seen his hoodie, and the princess told him no. The two then said their final goodbye. After Marco left, Star went upstairs and remade her bedroom. She walked to her room and pulled out Marco's hoodie from under her covers. His hoodie smelled very bad, but it reminded Star of all the great adventures that they had had together. Ponyhead showed up and saw Star with a hoodie and felt it was disgusting, and so she threw it into the laundry room. Star was, was very angered by this and spent the rest of the day trying to retrieve the hoodie. Star was very sad when it was put into the wash, but when it was given back to her, she still felt like it smelled like Marco. The night of the wash said to her that it might now be clean, but it still holds the memories. Star then sent the hoodie back to Marco as a symbol that she was ready to move on. Marco received the hoodie and thought it kind of smelled a bit like Star. On Cork 24, they celebrated the funeral of MHC member Lechmet, who had given his life to save Queen Moon before Toffee had been defeated. Princess Star felt very sad at the funeral and very weirded out due to all the all of Lechman's weird friends' music and the food he liked to eat. Star was getting herself some punch when she thought she saw me in the punch bowl and so jumped in to try to re retrieve me. Moon walked up to her and asked her daughter what, which, what she was doing. Star then explained how she was sure that she had seen me inside the punch. Moon explained to Star that it was Lechman's funeral and so she should be focusing on him and not Glossrick. Moon then taught Star a little phrase that her mother had taught her when she was feeling sad and needed to just let go of something. Blue, 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 below. I let you go. I let you go. That night when she was going to bed, Star started to see me everywhere, and Star was getting a little freaked out and decided to jump under her covers and call her friend Jana, who knew all about this witchy stuff. Jana told her that she was being haunted and that she just needed to get something. It was important to me and bury it. Star got the remains of the spell book that she had found at the monster temple and decided to bury it, but she buried it in a pet cemetery due to me being so small. Star continued to see me and she tried the blue bully. It didn't work and so called Jana back about it. Jana told her it would only get worse due to burying it in a pet cemetery. Jana then explained that Star needed to bury it in a place that had a great meaning to me. Star ran to the magic sanctuary and put the part of the spell book into the well of magic. Star then spoke to her reflection of me, saying I was sort of her friend and that she was going to miss me a lot. She performed the blue bully and was saying goodbye. Then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of magic blast out of the well, and I returned. Star ran to her parents to surprise them with the news, and her parents were indeed shocked. Star was so happy I was all right but did feel a little worried that I was only saying Globgor and acted a bit like a dog. On Thurk 71st, it was the second Silver Bell Ball that Star had gotten to attend. She was frustrated when thinking about that this is where she and Tom had met one year ago and that she'd have to dance with them again today. Tom and his family showed up a bit late and delayed the ball, but once they arrived, it went on as it should. Tom stood up for the first dance, and everyone expected him to go for Star, but he went to Princess Jack's instead. The whole rest of the night, Star and Tom were club snubbing each other, Star hoping to get his attention. Eventually, the time came, and only Star and Tom were left to dance. Star then asked Manfred to dance, which upset all the adults at the ball. Tom and Star then went outside to argue with, the, with each other. Tom revealed that he had been there on song day, and he knew that Star and Marco were together. Star was furious, fearing she would never be able to escape that horrible day. Star and Tom went back into the ballroom and danced to stop the fighting amongst the adults. They danced and made up, 
and then the ball came to an end. They decided to talk to one another at the end, and even decided to get back together. On their kitty first, Star met Eclipsa when she was walking into the Rose Garden. Star did not realize that it was Eclipsa until her mother and the MHC rushed in and held Eclipsa down. They took Eclipsa to the dungeon and Star to the examination room to make sure she wasn't corrupted. Star was frustrated by this due to how crazy the tests were to see if she was evil, especially due to how nice Eclipsa was to her. Soon, Moon came in and asked Star if she was alright, and Star explained her frustration to her mother, but Moon told Star that yes, Eclipsa may seem like someone you can trust, but she's not. Star asked what they were going to do with Eclipsa, and Moon explained that, th that the only reasonable thing to do was to recrystallize her. Star asked what Eclipsa even did to deserve this, and the Magical High Commission couldn't really answer it very well. All they could say was that Eclipsa fell in love with a monster, but Star said that wasn't enough. Crystallization was a very harsh punishment, and Eclipsa at least deserved a fair trial. Moon didn't care what Star had to say, and went on with the commission to crystallize Eclipsa. Star managed to get out of the room and found her wand, then flew on Cloudy to where they were keeping Eclipsa. Star burst into the room and quickly stopped Rombulus right as he was about to crystallize her. Star once again tried to convince them to please give Eclipsa a fair trial to prove that she was re really evil and did anything wrong. Moon showed Star her arms and how her veins looked now due to Eclipsa's magic. Star pointed out that Moon was the one who went to Eclipsa for help and she was the one who cast the spell on Toffee. Moon gave up and agreed to give Eclipsa a trial so she could prove to everyone that Eclipsa was evil and deserved crystallization. Star was very happy and had told Eclipsa that that's what they call the justice system. They then discussed where they would be keeping Eclipsa until the trial. The cell wasn't great, and it was decided that she would stay in her old room in the Rose Tower. It also wasn't great, but it was good enough for Eclipsa. Star came in to visit her later that day, informing her that even though she had helped Eclipsa get a trial, that didn't mean she trusted her. Eclipsa said that she was fine, and then both of them stared at the window at the beauty of the Rose Garden. Grievance 22nd Princess Star and Prince Tom were playing a board game while singing a song about burritos they wrote together. Tom left the room to quickly go use the restroom, and they continued to sing their song together. Star was singing when suddenly Marco came in through her window. Star was so surprised to see him. Why was he here? Marco told her how he decided he was going to take her father's offer and stay on Muni and become a knight. Just then, Tom walked into the room, and there was an awkward silence. The royal guard then ran up to see what the commotion was and identified Marco as the intruder. Star explained to them that Marco was not an intruder, and Marco interrupted and told them how King River gave him the cape and told him he could be a knight. The guards laughed at him for this. They then took them to see Star's parents about this. Queen Moon was frustrated and told Marco that, th that she was very sorry, but he couldn't just become a knight just like that. It takes years of training. King River then apologized and told Marco that he didn't actually think he was ever going to see Marco again, and that the cape he was wearing was just the king's meat blanket. Queen Moon and King River discussed for a moment who they thought Marco could squire for for the time being, but Princess Star said she knew a knight who could use a squire. Star walked Marco down to the sub-basement to introduce him to the knight. Marco wanted to talk to Star, but Star wanted to see as little of Marco as possible. She had just gotten over him. They arrived at their destination, and Star introduced Marco to the Knight of the Wash, Sir Lavabo. Marco asked why she chose this knight. They'd be so far apart. Couldn't, the pr couldn't she princess up him something better? This angered Star, and she said he wasn't grateful and ran up the stairs. Star walked into the rose garden where she found Eclipsa feeding the birds. Star asked to sit with her and maybe get some grandmotherly advice. Eclipsa was able to tell right away that the issue had to do with the boy, and Star explained her situation to Eclipsa. Eclipsa asked her that now that Marco had come to Muni, did she want her to stay? Star said yes, but it didn't matter anymore. He already was squiring for the Night of the Wash. Eclipsa gasped when she heard this and told Star that the Wash was the most dangerous squiring job and that Marco wouldn't last long. Star then ran back down to the Wash to try and save Marco. 
Star asked Lavabo where Marco was and explained that Marco was in the Lint Catcher. Star jumped into the Lint Catcher to find him, but was too loud and woke the Lint Monster. Star and Marco defeated the Lint Monster together and walked out. Lavabo congratulated Marco and explained that no other squire besides him had ever defeated the Lint Catcher. Star then apologized to Lavabo and, ex and explained that this job wasn't for Marco. Star then brought Marco upstairs and made him his own room and made him her own official squire. It was the next day and Marco's first day as Star's personal squire. He wanted to do all he could to be the best squire and prove he deserved this position. They went to the Quest by Dimension for a squire competition. Throughout the whole thing, Marco tried really hard to be the best, but Star really just wanted to have fun. After Marco really started to freak out, Star explained that she didn't need any of this stuff. She wasn't a knight, and Marco ju was just squiring for her so she could try to have some fun with him. Star and Marco then decided to just forget about the rest of the competition and just go shopping and have fun together, getting what they wanted for the sale. They walked out and purchased the things they wanted, ending their adventure happy laughing together. Darturk 11th. Star, Marco, and Princess Ponyhead decided to go to St. O's, which was now a party school, to reveal the truth to the princesses that Princess Tradina was in fact a boy wearing a costume. When they arrived at the school, Marco was ready to tell them all that he was a lie, but as the day went on, the princesses showed him how much Princess Tardina meant to them. Marco lost his confidence and decided not to tell them the truth. He went up on stage to give a speech, and then Miss Haynes appeared through a portal, interrupting him. Miss Haynes told the princesses that they needed her and she needed them, and that Princess Tardina was in fact a boy. Miss Haynes pulled down Marco's dress to reveal a chest hair. The princesses didn't believe her, and then Marco revealed to them that it was true. The princesses told him that it was okay. Princess Tardina was an idea. The princesses then all chased Miss Haynes and her gang away. Marco and Star left the school to go back to Muni, and Star was happy that Marco had told the truth. Square Turk 58th, Princess Star and Prince Lucifer were shopping in the streets of Muni when a shop owner told the monster he could not buy from the store. The store owner then told the same to Prince Tom, not realizing who he was, but once he did, he begged for forgiveness. Princess Star was troubled by how the Muman culture saw monsters and how they treated royalty like Tom. Star decided to run up to her mother and try to fix this problem. She ran into her mother's office with a diagram and tried to ask her mom what makes a monster a monster. Queen Moon explained to her that people like the pigeons are people who are rich and therefore not monsters. She explained that kingdoms that they've had ties with for years, like the pony heads, are not monsters. Star explained to her mother that this still didn't make a lot of sense to her and that she didn't understand. Moon replied telling her that she doesn't make the rules the real monster expert does. Star was shocked to learn of this and that her mom was not in charge of this, of this subject. Star went to find this monster expert and asked them to change the rules. She eventually found the right door of Dr. Goodwill, the Muni monster expert. When Star started explaining to her that the way they treated monsters was wrong, Dr. Goodwill agreed, seeing that she had been waiting for years for a princess like Star. They then went on an adventure together to Dr. Goodwill's tree fort so she could explain her plan to Star. Sadly, it turned out that she saw monsters as lesser beings than humans and wanted to preserve them like pets. Star was able to warn the monsters and together save their village from being destroyed by Dr. Goodwill. Dr. Goodwill still didn't get it at the end of the day, and so Star appointed Buffrog, the new human monster expert. It was Scar Turk 82nd. Star was having the most wonderful dream of her flying with goblin dogs and eating them. She awoke with such a happy feeling, and Marco right beside her. Marco pointed out that there were goblin dog wrappers all around her, and then the princess burped, realizing that she did go to that dimension. Star needed to figure out what she did, and how she got these goblin dogs, and so she told Marco to watch her sleep that night and see if she did it again. Marco watched, but eventually fell asleep, and when he awoke, he saw that Star transformed into her ultimate butterfly form and opened a portal and flew in and brought out with her the whole goblin dog truck. Marco explained to Star what had happened, and this worried the princess. When she went to have her supper with her family again that night, she decided to ask her mother about the butterfly form. 
Her mom explained to her that it appears in times of need. Star then asked, what if it just happened randomly? Her father then began to laugh and then said that if it happened, they'd need to imprison her and lock her up and eventually they'd just need to adopt a new princess. Queen Moon then asked Star why she was asking this and Star replied that she just wanted to be prepared for if it did ever happen. When it was time for Star to go to bed, she chained herself up and told Marco to watch her once more. Sadly, Marco fell asleep again but awoke this time to see a butterfly star trying to escape her bed. She eventually opened the portal and broke her chains, and Marco was attached by a rope and so also was dragged into the portal. He was very worried, and his frightening screams managed to wake up Star, and, and as she awoke, she started to de-transform. They both then started to float in space. Luckily, I jumped through the portal, attached to a rope, and grabbed both of them and pulled them back in. Once they came back through the portal, they realized that it was Eclipsa who had pulled them back with the rope. Star thanked Eclipsa, but asked why and how she was out of her tower. Eclipsa said she was just returning me to a star when I had come to her room. Star then asked Marco and I to leave the room for a second, and Eclipsa started walking away as well, but Star stopped her and asked for some advice. Star explained the situation to her grandmother, and Eclipsa told her that she wouldn't run from these dreams if it were her. She would see what happens. Star questioned if this was really what she should do, and Eclipsa told her that all knowledge is good knowledge. Eclipsa then started to walk away, back to her room, and Star asked her once again how she had escaped. Eclipsa told her that because they were sharing secrets, that she would share one too. She turned to the painting of Alphonse the Worthy and asked for his permission to come aboard. He winked, and then a stairwell was revealed to be behind the painting. Eclipsa then went into the passage and asked Star to keep her secret. Star went back to her room and then explained to Marco that she didn't need him to watch her again. Marco agreed, but once Star fell asleep, he returned back to the room to watch her. After the events of Squire Turk 58th, and hearing what her mother had to say about what makes you a monster, Star decided to travel around to the other royals and try to get their signatures to make monsters and humans equal. Star had collected lots of signatures, and the last thing they needed was from the rich pigeons. Star brought Ponyhead and Marco, and they traveled to the kingdom of pigeons. When they arrived, they explained their case, and it didn't seem as if the pigeons understood. Marco then rudely grabbed a rich pigeon's foot and tried to make him sign it, saying that they were just dumb birds. When attempting to make a rich pigeon sign it, Marco accidentally broke Rich's leg. The pigeons all panicked at that and then started chasing them. Star, Marco, and Pony had managed to hide for a while, but in the end were captured. They were put in a cage and they were going to be sentenced with death by peck. Just then, rich pigeons entered the room and started speaking English. All the pigeons around him were starting to get very mad and Rich explained that yes, he did learn the Mumin tongue, but, but he needed to for the better of his kingdom. So I think he, they should have just continued to keep pretending to be mindless birds. He agreed to sign Star's petition and then set Star and her friends free. They were then offered to have a meal with the pigeons, but Star denied saying that they would just go home. It all started on Squire Turk 82nd, but had not been brought to major attention until Org 23rd. The day started with Star having some trouble with me and wondering where Marco was, then found him exiting a portal and asked where he had been all day, and he replied that he had been fishing. Star explained to him that she really could have used his help that day, and he apologized. The next day it was almost the same, and she ended up having a lot of trouble with me again, and not knowing where Marco had gone. She found him once again exiting a portal, and said that she really could have used some help from her squire. She then realized the signs Marco had had. Dimensional scissors, red portal, bald spot, Marco had been hanging out with Hecapoo again. Marco apologized and handed his scissors to Star to make sure that he wouldn't use them again. But that night, Marco snuck into Star's room and stole the scissors to use once again. Star drifted off to sleep and when she awoke, Marco was in front of her trying to put the scissors back. Star was so was so angered and asked why Marco was doing this. Marco then explained to her that he had been closing her portals with Hecapu. Ever since that first night where she had gone into her butterfly form, she had continued to be transforming. Star began to worry, remembering what her father had said. 
Star then asked if Hecapu knew about it, and Marco confirmed that yes, she knew, and she wasn't happy about it. He explained to Star that she, that she almost got taken out that night, and would have if he wasn't there to save her. The next day, Star decided to invite Gianna over to Muni to try to help with the situation. They attached a camera to Star's head, and when she fell asleep, they would record, track, and try to figure out where Star was going. Star explained to them that every night she heard this weird sound as if something was calling her. Gianna would then hypnotize Star to make her fall right asleep. And right away, Star went into her butterfly form and opened a portal. Gianna and Marco were watching her to try to figure out where she was trying to go. Star continued to fly through portals, opening portal after portal after portal, until she stopped at one point and looked around. She then started to open a huge portal and then stared at it and slowly went in. But as she went in, she, she knocked the camera tracker right off her head. Star then awoke, drifting up from, a, from some magic, and a unicorn began licking her nose. The unicorn woke her and told her that she was there. Star was very confused and asked where that was. The little unicorn explained that she was in the realm of magic, and Star mentioned how it was as if Toffee was never even there. A large unicorn then came running up the water, making such a weird noise. Star asked the unicorn to stop, and asked the unicorn to please explain who she was and why she called her there. The unicorn explained that she was the firstborn, and that she did not know why, and she can only call one that wants to be called. Star then told them that she needed to go home, but the little unicorn asked her to know, please stay. Star said she had to get back to Marco, but the unicorns continued to plead, and then the princess started to feel weird and forget things, and said she guessed she could stay a little longer. She hopped onto the firstborn, and they dove into the magic. Time passed, and Star sat on the pillar of liquid magic, saying names, trying to remember what her own was. Then, the all-seeing eye portal appeared, and Marco called out to her. He had crescent moons on his cheeks, and had used Star's wand, transforming it to match his personality. He continued to call out to her to please come back, and in doing so, he reminded Star of her name. Star thanked the strange boy. Again, he pleaded for her to come home, and she explained to him that she was home. Marco tried to reach through the seeing eye to grab Star, but once his fingers touched the eye, it vanished. Star then started to say the boy's name, Marco. She started to slightly regain her memory, and then jumped up realizing what had happened. Star quickly transformed into her butterfly form, unintentionally, but this time being able to retain consciousness. The unicorn asked Star where she was going, and Star said to them that she had to go home. But the unicorns continued to ask her to stay. Star apologized, opened the portal, and flew back to her room. There, she found things exploded everywhere. Marco on the floor, holding the wand. She took her wand back, and it transformed back into how it was before. Star quickly caught Janna from falling from the ceiling, and then showed them her new ability to transform at will. They asked if Star was still hearing that sound, and she explained that she guessed she wasn't, and that she'd probably stop sleep portaling now. It was Torax sixth, meaning it's stump it was stump day and also Star's fifteenth birthday. The people were celebrating and worshipping the stump as they always did. The celebration went well and Star went to bed glad. Marco would soon come into her room and ask for her assistance downstairs. Star got up out of her bed and walked downstairs, but once she turned on the lights she found all of her friends, a band, and a whole bunch of posters saying happy birthday star. The band started to play music. All of her friends jumped out and yelled, Surprise! Happy birthday, Star! But Star was frustrated, explaining to Marco that he couldn't do this. She explained to him how they had never celebrated her birthday on the stump day. They were supposed to spend every moment in love and appreciation of the stump. Star began to take down the posters, pop the balloons, break the music and musical instruments, and all of her friends told her to relax. The stump wasn't real. Marco, Marco explained how he just wanted her to have a nice quinceanera for her since it was such an important birthday and that she shouldn't worry about the silly stump thing. Then all of Star's friends started arguing about all these different things and Star opened the windows to try to make the wind come in just like the first humans huddling together around the stump when it was too cold. The friends continued to argue saying that the stump was not real and that Star was just crazy 
and then they all turned around to find Jana burning the stump in the fire to warm herself. All of a sudden, the stump started to grab onto people, starting with Jana. Moon and River came out of their rooms to ask what was happening to find everyone being held by the stump, and then they too were grabbed by the stump. Star told everyone to just hold hands and try to enjoy their last breaths together in love, and then, in a second, it was over. They were all so happy, thinking that their love had saved them, but Star said no, it just stopped because stump day had ended. The king and queen revealed that even they didn't really believe in the stump, but they would have to try extra hard next year to, to try to get back on the stump's good side. They all agreed that now that stump day was over, that they would celebrate Star's birthday. Star, when she obtained her ultimate magic form. For the rest of Star's journey, please stay tuned for Biography Part 4. And have a good day. Goodbye.